Van Badham, who, who, who uh, described, was described not by me as a writer, activist, and Twitter queen, um, which is, I think, like being the red queen in, in Alice in Wonderland, something like that. I went on her Twitter site today to find out how many followers she has, but apparently I'm not one of them because I'm blocked. And, <laughs> and it kind of surprises me because um, I didn't know that I'd ever tried to follow her. But anyways, she said, and this was interesting, she said, I'm a Christian and a Marxist. And I thought, no. Um, you can only be a Christian and a Marxist if you, well, there's a couple of ways. One is, one is that you just want to be all things that are good at once, regardless of their internal contradictions. And so that would be one reason. And another reason would be that you don't know anything about Christianity or Marxism. Um, and, and, and then the next would be that you're just compartmentalized. You know, like, there's this idea that people can't hold two contradictory thoughts in their mind at the same time. Well, that idea was formulated by someone who, who's never met a human being. Because you can hold like 50 contradictory thoughts in your head at the same time, as you know whenever you argue with someone that you love, because you love them, and maybe you even like them, but you also hate them, and you wish that you could just crush them right there and then. And so, like, that's a lot of contradictory ideas, and that's probably only like half the contradictory ideas that are running through your mind at the moment. You know, so, man, you're so full of contradictions that it's just beyond belief, and the only time I mean, I know this because I read undergraduate essays. And what's, what's interesting about undergraduate essays is it's so interesting because the undergraduate will make a claim in paragraph one, and then in paragraph seven will make the opposite claim. And they won't notice that they're intellectually incommensurate. And, you know, that might happen 30 times in the essay. And, and the reason that that works is because, well, they haven't been called on the paradoxes, but also because they haven't had to live the paradoxes through. Because you really only straighten out your thought when you have, like, impulse A and impulse B, and they conflict at the same time, right? And you can either do one or the other, but not both. You know, if it's A today and B tomorrow, well, then you can be, you can hold those ideas simultaneously. But if it's A or B right now, then you have to decide, is A more important or is B more important? You have to put them in a hierarchy, and then you have to act them out, and you have to see what happens. And so then you find out if you're full of contradictions, and part of the way that you iron out your contradictions, which is very, very hard to do, is that you go out and you do a whole bunch of things in the world, like Socrates did. You go out and you have your adventure in the world, and you put your ideas to the test, and those that work out in a paradoxical or counterproductive manner you dispense with or put lower on the priority list or something like that. And that's how you discover that, you know, you can't hold incommensurate views simultaneously. Uh, Carl Jung said that um, something like, paradoxical views that are not made conscious will be played out in the world as fate. And that's really worth thinking about too. So if you have your let's call it your typical negative experience. You know, it's this thing that just keeps, seems to just keep happening to you. Bad luck, let's call it. It's highly probable that there's a set of ideas that are occupying you, preoccupying you, possessing you, that are driving you in this direction continually, and that you, you can't or won't work out the contradiction, and as a consequence, you know, maybe you think every woman is your mother, and you haven't noticed that you think that, and that, that you know, and, and it is something that people think, because women are, or mothers are women, and it's not a bad initial template, but, you know, you've got you to gotta modify it to some degree. And, you know, if, if that's an unconscious idea that you have, and you continue to play it out, you may run into your continual habitual negative experience with women, and you'll wonder what the hell is wrong with women, but there, it isn't the women that has the problem, it's you. And, and 
you know, if you run into problems with women all the time, um, then it's highly probable that the problem is you. So, <laughs> not always, but generally. So, well, let's go into this Marxist and Christian idea here just for a minute. So, oh, we'll, start with, we'll start with some of the ideas of Marx. Um, well, Marx believed that people were basically socially constructed so that we, we were blank slates and that whatever our nature was was given to us essentially by our surroundings, but even more importantly by our social class, right? Because Marx was a theorist of social class and believed that the primary dispute, let's say, the, the primary motivator of human history, the primary driver of human history was something like the rich versus the poor, the bourgeoisie versus the proletariat, and that was a consequence of your social upbringing and that your group identity was paramount. Okay, so there's nothing about that that's vaguely Christian. That's not how the Christian worldview works, it's not how the Judeo-Christian worldview works, because in that worldview you're fundamentally an individual, your nature is fundamentally attributable to you by God, you're fundamentally responsible to God, and your and, and history itself is something like the playing out of your relationship to the transcendent. So those things aren't even, those aren't the same. They're not commensurate. You can't believe both of them at the same time. Um, Marxism is a materialistic philosophy. It's predicated on the idea that, um, essentially, uh, an idea that Dostoevsky criticized in great depth was that if you just made people rich enough, let's say, if you deprive them of their privation, if you equalize their economic status, let's say, um, that the utopia would come to light upon earth. And, you know, I, I have a certain amount of sympathy for a viewpoint like that, because, you know, who likes starvation and, and misery? You know, there, there's nothing positive to be said about that, but I think Dostoevsky was right, too, in his criticism of Marxism, although he wasn't directly aiming this at Marx, in Notes from Underground, where he noted that, you know, if you gave people what they wanted in terms of, let's say, bread and circuses, if they had, as he said, nothing to do but eat cakes and busy themselves with the continuation of the species, which is kind of a nice phrase, um, that the first thing they would do is take a hammer and smash things just so that something improbable and strange would happen, just so that we could have our way. You know, and, and it's kind of a recapitulation of the idea of original sin in, in Dostoevsky's subtle manner, is that we're the sorts of creatures that, you know, what did he say? We're ungrateful. That's the thing that primarily distinguishes us from animals, is we're ungrateful and that we can curse. That was what he thought made us different than animals. And that if, even if we got what we wanted materially, that wouldn't satisfy us, because we're not the sorts of creatures that can be satisfied with material possessions, let's say, or material comfort, because it isn't even obvious that we're after comfort. I mean, what, what do you want? You want to you just lay in a feather bed and eat peeled grapes all day? I mean, maybe for an hour or so, that might not be a bad idea, but, you know, you're, it's going to get dull pretty quick. You're going to go out looking for trouble. And, and it's certainly possible that the more material resources and the easier they were to get that you have at your disposal, the more creative ways you're going to find to cause yourself trouble when you go out and look for trouble. And so, and that's a testament to the human spirit, and Dostoevsky knew this. It's like, well, whatever we're here for, it isn't the utopia of equal material distribution. That, that's not we're, not, we're not, we're not looking to be fed and asleep, you know? And I don't know what it is that we're looking for. God only knows. Maybe what we're looking for is to continually keep looking, something like that. I mean, that's the sorts of creatures that we are. But, but, the, but the materialist philosophy is that, well, if you just provided for people economically, problem over. And uh, no, wrong. I mean, most of you are, as given that you're, you know, you're going to be ill in one way or another, and that you're still subject to mortality and, and all of the terrible natural limitations that human beings are characterized by, you're about as well off as you're going to get. You know, the, the economic data already show that once you have enough money so that bill collectors aren't chasing you, 
which basically puts you, say, at the kind of in the upper reaches of the working class or maybe the lower end of the middle class, something like that, that additional money has absolutely no effect whatsoever on your self-reported well-being, which is something like a combination of positive emotion and absence of negative emotion. So, you might like to think that, you know, if you were rich, your life would be better, and maybe it would be somewhat better, but it wouldn't be as much better as you might hope. Um, and that's because you'd still have most of the problems that people have. You know, you still maybe wouldn't get along with your sister, and you'd still get divorced, and maybe you'd even be more likely to, and there'd still be illnesses that would beset you. You'd be able to deal with them, perhaps, with some degree of more urgency. Um, but, and you'd still have the problem with what the hell your life is for, and what you're doing on the planet, and how to conduct yourself in the proper way. And so, so we don't want to be too naive about materialism, even though we don't want to be ungrateful for its advantages. Marx also believed, well, I said this already, that you know, history was basically characterized by the war of socioeconomic groups. That's been transformed more recently into the war of identity groups, which is the same damn thing, and it's the same old wolf in new sheep's clothing, as far as I'm concerned, that, you know, the best way to conceptualize human beings is, well, I don't know, whatever your damn identity is, maybe it's sex for you, and it's ethnicity for you, and it's gender for you, and God only knows what it is for you, and, you know, and that's who you identify with, and all there is in the world, and this is the postmodernist view, is hierarchies of people in these identity groups struggling for dominion. You know, and that's a quasi-Marxist viewpoint. It's just a variant of the bourgeoisie versus proletariat theory of history, which is a foolish theory, as far as I'm concerned, and certainly not one that we need to take forward into the 21st century, although we seem, you know, destined to insist that we do so. He believed that the revolutionary overthrow of the oppressor class was necessary and morally demanded, and um, that turns out to be a little bloodier than I would say the typical Christian, Judeo-Christian ethic might require, because it doesn't require you to take up arms against your evil overlords and well, put them in gulags and kill them by the millions, for example, and that to me seems to be an important difference. Um, there's, there's no, in, in the Judeo-Christian tradition, there's no guilt, there's no group guilt, right? You're guilty, and you're guilty, and of different things, I, I presume, um, and, and that's your problem, but maybe you're also innocent, who knows, you know, but whatever, it's on you. It's not a consequence of your racial heritage, or your ethnicity, or your gender, any of those things. It's, it's between you and God, let's say, or it's between you and the state even, but at least it's between you and the state, or God. It's not like, well, you know, your father was a, a factory owner, let's say your grandfather, and so it was perfectly reasonable during the Russian Revolution and the Red Terror to vacuum you up along with your whole family and do away with you because you'd been irredeemably tainted by your bourgeoisie past. So that's another place where Marxism and Judeo-Christianity are, they're, they're not just different, like they're opposite. You know, it's not just variant one and variant two, these are like seriously different ideas. And so there's another reason you can't be a Marxist and a Christian. If you, and then there's the idea that, um, you know, that Marx had that religion was the opiate of the masses, which doesn't exactly sound like, I've always thought religion was the opiate of the masses, but communism, Marxism was the um, methamphetamine of the, of the masses, let's say, yeah, the meth of the masses. We, we would, we had no idea with regards to opiates. So here's what Marx has to say about religion. The abolition of religion as the illusory happiness of the people is the demand for their real happiness. To call on them to give up their illusions about their condition is to call on them to give up a condition that requires illusions. It's interesting to me because it's not like the Judeo-Christian story was really a happy one. As, as far as I can tell, you know, I mean, there was heaven, but the chances you were going to get in, man, that was low. And, and, and mostly it was a um, fair bit of original sin, 
you know, and a fair bit of you wrestling with all of your inadequacies and your proclivity towards malevolence, to pick up your cross, to bear your suffering, to understand that, you know, there was a war in your soul between the forces of good and evil. It's like, how that's an opiate is beyond me. I mean, if I was going to design an opiate that made people feel better, I'd certainly dispense with a fair bit of that. It's like, whatever you do is okay. We could start with that. There's certainly no hell. <laughs> that's something we're going to get rid of right away. A little less guilt and shame would be, it would kind of be like a hippie cult in the 1960s, you know, with a little more marijuana and some free sex, something, something like that. So I don't really understand the illusion idea. There is Marx's criticism, I suppose, of the belief of, you know, the great, the great father in the sky who who, who still doesn't seem to me to be that, like, he's sort of still kind of a nightmarish creature, all things considered, since at least in principle he's keeping track of everything you do, even more than you are, and that's not such a good thing, but whatever. So it's a foolish criticism, as far as I can tell, but doesn't matter, he still criticized it. The criticism of religion is therefore in embryo, the criticism of that veil of tears of which religion is the halo. Criticism, meaning his, has plucked the imaginary flowers on the chain, not in order that man shall continue to bear that chain without fantasy or consolation, but so that he shall throw off the chain and pluck the living flower. <laughs> That's something that plenty of Marxists did, I can tell you. The criticism of religion disillusions man so that he will think, act, and fashion his reality like a man who has discarded his illusions and regained his senses so that he will move around himself as his own true son. S-U-N. Yeah, well, that's, that's Marxism in a nutshell, all right. I mean, that's, like, that's the fundamental definition of pathological nar narcissism. So that he will move around himself as his own true son. Right. Religion is only the illusory son which revolves around man as long as he does not revolve around himself. And, you know, generally, we, don't we use that as an insult? He only revolves around himself? Isn't that an insult? And isn't there, isn't there a reason for that? Don't we assume that there's something that you should be revolving around that isn't just yourself? You know, it's, 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 and it could be many things, you know, it could be, well, someone you love, that, that would be a start, it could be a child, it could, could be your, your partner in life, it could be, it could be your, ex, your family in extension, it could be your community, it could be some noble ideal that you're trying to serve, it should be something other than you as the primary center of the universe around which, well, you and presumably everything else revolves, so I don't really see that as a particularly wise, um, what would you call it, philosophy, and as it manifested itself in the world. You know, I would say Stalin probably revolved around himself quite nicely, since, and uh, don't you think, I mean, it's a, if you had to pick someone who was revolving around himself, it would be a, a pretty decent competition between Mao and Stalin, and, 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 and that didn't seem to be, that didn't seem to be for the best, so, so that's something to consider as well. Um, the Marxists believe that religion hindered human development, and the Soviets and the Maoists instituted state atheism, apart from the worship of their leaders, of course. Um, and then I'm going to read you a poem by Marx. This is a good one. I found this a while back. God, it's a rough poem. And, you know, you want to, you want to let your imagination sort of, I would say, let your imagination loose with, with this poem, which is what you should do with a poem. And imagine the sort of state of mind that you have to be in to write a poem like this. And then also imagine, as you should, that poetry, like dreams, are the birth, it's the birthplace of thought. With my undergraduates often, especially ones that are really obsessed with ideas, they'll often put really bad poetry in their essays. And, and I'm not saying that in a, in a cynical way, because bad poetry can have good ideas in it. It's, it's hard to write good poetry, you know. But, the thing is, often an idea that's extraordinarily emotional in content will manifest itself as a poem before it is able to articulate itself out into a fully expressed philosophy. And so I see this with my undergraduates. They'll really be obsessed with something that's bothering them, then they'll write some poem, often about a personal experience, and then as I help them shape the essay, they kind of unfold the poem into an articulated statement about the structure of reality. And so you could say, well, you know, we're all embedded in the dream, we know that, 
you go to sleep every night and you dream, you're embedded in your imagination. If, if, you're, if you're forbidden to dream, if you're deprived of your dreams, you will lose your mind. That's been experimentally demonstrated quite nicely on animals, but also on human beings. You have to dream. You have to enter that, that realm of incoherent imagination and possibility in order to maintain your sanity, which is extraordinarily interesting and very strange. And I would say poetry exists on the border between the dream and, the, and fully articulate wakefulness. It's, 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 it's the place where the image of the dream meets the... Meets the, meets the meets the articulated speech of full consciousness. And so you can think about that with regards to this poem. Um, invocation of one in despair. So, a god has snatched from me all my all in the curse and rack of destiny. All his worlds are gone beyond recall. Nothing but revenge is left to me. On myself, revenge all proudly wreak. On that being, that enthroned Lord, make my strength a patchwork of what's weak. Leave my better self without reward. I shall build my throne high overhead, cold, tremendous shall its summit be for its bulwark, superstitious dread for its martial, blackest agony. Who looks upon it with a healthy eye shall turn back, struck deathly pale and dumb, clutched by blind and chill mortality. May his happiness prepare its tomb. And the Almighty's lightning shall rebound from that massive iron giant. If he brings my walls and towers down, eternity shall raise them up, defiant. Well, I would say that's the sort of poem that would be written by someone who revolved around himself as his own true son. And I would also say that given what we know about what happened as a consequence of the instantiation of Marxist doctrine, that this is a truly horrifying piece of literature to contemplate. Written, by the way, when Marx was rather young. 